Having discussed cache coherence, let's move on to a number of other topics that all pertain to multiprocessor design. And let's start with synchronization. So when you're writing a multi-threaded application, the expectation is that all of these threads are coordinating to perform a single high-level task. And in order to make that happen, these threads are going to share some variables that they may all be simultaneously reading or writing. And if you allowed this to happen, if you allowed all of these threads to simultaneously read and modify some values, you end up in what are called race conditions. Okay, so to prevent these race conditions, we introduced the notion of locks and other synchronization primitives. And let me, let me motivate that with this example over here. So let's say that you have a banking application and some multi-threaded application. The many threads of the application all deal with the same variables. So let's say that there is a couple that has a shared bank account and that bank account has a balance of $1,000 as I'm showing you over here. So there is a single variable that stores that, that bank balance. And let's say that the husband and the wife are both at different ATMs and they're both trying to deposit some money into their bank account. Now, this is a multi-threaded application because there's one thread running on the first ATM, there's a second thread running on the second ATM, and both of these threads are going to be accessing the shared variable, which is this couple's bank balance. So what the first thread does is it reads the value of the current bank balance. At the same time, let's say that the wife is also depositing something in the ATM, she has started up her thread, and that thread also starts doing a read to find out what the current bank balance is. Once those values have been fetched into registers, you know, since you're depositing $100 in one case and $200 in the second case, you are going to do some register math to figure out that the new bank balance is now $1,100 in one case and $1,200 in the second case. And then that thread finally ends by saying, you know, let's now write this register value into the variable which has the bank balance, right? So it ends with this write statement over here, which says, let's put this into into the memory location for the bank balance. And similarly, the thread at the other ATM is trying to do a write of the value 1200 into that same memory location, right? So it doesn't really matter what happens first. Let's assume that this write happens first, followed by this write. And the net result is that the second write overwrites whatever was done by the first write. So at the end of both of these transactions, the bank balance has a value of 1200 which we all know is clearly incorrect. What should have happened is you should be adding 100 to the bank balance of 1000, followed by adding 200 to that. So instead of having a bank balance of 1300, depending on which order the writes happen, you could end up with an incorrect bank balance of either 1100 or 1200, right? So this is an example of a race condition where there were multiple threads, both dealing with the same variable. And because you did not use the right synchronization primitives, you end up with a result which is incorrect and which the programmer did not intend. So a race condition is defined by multiple accesses to the same shared variables, where at least one of those accesses happens to be a write. And so when you do encounter what appears to be a race condition in your code, to avoid that race condition and to avoid unpredictable behavior, what you should be doing is protecting that piece of code with a lock and an unlock which ensures that only you are going to be accessing those variables at that time. Okay, so this piece of code would look something like this, where before I get into my racy code, I'm going to say acquire a lock L1, and when you're done, you're going to release the lock L1. And same way over here, the second thread also does the same thing. Before it enters, it's going to acquire a lock, and when it's done, it's going to release the lock. And so when these threads execute, let's say that this thread executes the lock statement first, if the lock is free, right, and the lock is a variable which says that only one person can acquire the lock at a time and everybody else has to wait until the lock is released before they can acquire the lock. So when you try this lock statement and nobody else has the lock, you succeed in acquiring the lock, then you go ahead and execute this portion of the code, which is also referred to as the critical section or CS. And after you're done, you're going to release the lock in the meantime, the second thread may have also been trying to acquire the lock. When it sees that the lock L1 is currently occupied by somebody else, it's just going to sit there and wait. It's going to repeatedly try and acquire the lock. Eventually, when this unlock statement happens, that's when this lock succeeds, and that allows the second thread to enter its critical section. And then when it's done, it releases the lock. So with this synchronization primitive in place, we are ensuring mutual exclusion, where only one thread 
can execute the critical section at a time. And this ensures that the husband's transaction, for example, happens first, followed by the wife's transaction. And that allows the bank balance to be updated correctly and you know sequentially move from 1000 to 1100 and then finally to 1300. So in general, it's a good idea not to have races in your code, but to always protect those critical sections or those accesses to shared variables with the appropriate locks and unlocks. What I'm going to discuss next is how exactly are these locks implemented in hardware. So acquiring a lock can be a fairly slow process. And so having some hardware support to implement these locks can really help accelerate the programs. So here is what that hardware primitive looks like. So most processors will provide support for what is referred to as an atomic exchange operation, which says that in one fell swoop, without any interruption from any other entities, I'm going to swap the contents of a memory location and a register location. So you could have $1 sitting in your register over here, and in your memory you have one memory location over here. So with an atomic exchange operation, the value in the register gets placed in this memory location, and the value in the memory location gets moved into that register location. And the word atomic in this case essentially means that no one else is going to be reading or writing this register location and this memory location at the same time. So it's almost as if this exchange happened in an indivisible manner. A commonly used instruction that implements atomic exchange is referred to as test and set. And I'll show you how that works with this example over here. So in this piece of code down here, I'm actually implementing the code I need for my critical section, right? So the critical section is here where I'm going to access a bunch of shared variables. And before I get into that critical section, I'm making sure that I have acquired a lock and I do it with a test and set instruction. So what I'm doing here is I'm first writing a one into the register location. So $1 has a value of one, let's say, and the memory location, if it has a zero, it means that the lock is currently unoccupied. If the memory location has a value one, it means that the lock is currently occupied. Okay, so I do a test and set, which is essentially swapping the contents of register and the memory location. And once I'm done with that, I'm going to check the value that shows up in my register, right? So once the swap has happened, what I'm really doing is putting a one into that memory location saying I, I want to acquire the lock. And at the end of this instruction, for sure, the lock has been occupied either by me or by somebody who came before me. And what this branch condition over here is doing is checking to see if the lock was already occupied before I made this attempt. So now when I check the value of the register, if the register has a value one, then it means that the lock was already occupied before I executed my test and set. If the register value happens to be a zero, then it means that the lock was unoccupied and my test and set has now successfully acquired the lock. So if the register value is zero, then I carry on and execute the critical section, knowing fully well that at the moment nobody else has the lock and I'm the one who has acquired the lock and put a one into that memory location. Once I'm done with the critical section, to release the lock, all I need to do is store a value zero into that memory location. And that lets others who are attempting a test and set, it allows them to observe that their test and set has succeeded and they have now acquired the lock. If the register value that I examined turns out to be a one, then it means that the lock was already occupied. I can't get into the critical section right now. And so I should just loop back and try again, right? So that's what this branch does. If the value of the register is non-zero, then I branch back over here and I attempt my test and set again. So with this relatively simple instruction, this test and set, and with this relatively simple piece of code, I have been able to implement a lock and an unlock operation. And you can build other synchronization primitives using similar instructions. And I should point out that even a test and set instruction is relatively slow because it involves a memory access. And it's possible to speed things up a little bit by having caches, by having cache coherence support that ensures that, you know, when you modify a lock variable, everybody else that has cached that lock also gets to see those changes. Okay, so for now, just trust me that with caching, things continue to work just fine and things get faster than having to go to memory every single time to perform the test and set.